Section nine of Revenge by Robert Barr. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Section nine, the Bromley Gibbert story. The room in which John Shorely edited the weekly Sponge was not luxuriously furnished, but it was comfortable. A few pictures decorated the walls mostly black and white drawings by artists who were so unfortunate as to be compelled to work for the sponge on the cheap magazines and papers were littered all about chiefly american in their origin for shorely had been brought up in the editorial school which teaches that it is cheaper to steal from a foreign publication than waste good money on original contributions you clipped out the story changed new york to london boston or philadelphia to manchester or liverpool and there you were shorely's theory was that the public was a fool and didn't know the difference some of the greatest journalistic successes in london proved the fact he claimed yet the sponge frequently bought stories from well-known authors and bragged greatly about it shorely's table was littered with manuscripts but the attention of the great editor was not upon them he sat in his wooden armchair with his gaze on the fire and a frown on his brow the sponge was not going well and he feared he would have to adopt some of the many prize schemes that were such a help to pure literature elsewhere or offer a thousand pounds insurance tied up in such a way that it would look lavishly generous to the constant reader yet be impossible to collect if a disaster really occurred in the midst of his meditation a clerk entered and announced mr bromley gibberts tell him i'm busy just now tell him i'm engaged said the editor while the perplexed frown deepened on his brow the clerk's conscience however was never burdened with that message for gibberts entered with a long ulster coat flapping about his heels that's all right said gibberts waving his hand at the boy who stood with open mouth appalled at the intrusion you heard what mr shorely said he's engaged therefore let no one enter get out the boy departed closing the door after him gibberts turned the key in the lock and then sat down there he said now we can talk unmolested surely i should think you would be pestered to death by all manner of idiots who come in and interrupt you i am said the editor shortly then take my plan and lock your door communicate with the outer office through a speaking tube i see you are downhearted so i have come to cheer you up i've brought you a story my boy shorely groaned my dear gibberts he said we have now oh yes i know all about that you have matter enough on hand to run the paper for the next fifteen years if this is a comic story you are buying only serious stuff if this be tragic humor is what you need of course the up and down truth is that you are short of money and can't pay my price the sponge is failing everybody knows that why can't you speak the truth surely to me at least if you practiced an hour a day and took lessons from me for instance you would be able in a month to speak several truthful sentences one after the other the editor laughed bitterly you are complimentary he said i'm not try again surely say i'm a boorish ass well you are there you see how easy it is practice is everything now about this story will you i will not as you are not an advertiser i don't mind admitting to you that the paper is going down you see it comes to the same thing 
we haven't the money as you say so what's the use of talking gibberts hitched his chair closer to the editor and placed his hand on the other's knee he went on earnestly now is the time to talk surely in a little while it'll be too late you will have thrown up the sponge your great mistake is trying to ride two horses each facing a different direction it can't be done my boy make up your mind whether you're going to be a thief or an honest man that's the first step what do you mean you know what i mean go in for a paper that will be entirely stolen property or for one made up of purely original matter we have a great deal of original matter in the sponge yes and that's what i object to have it all original or have it all stolen be fish or fowl at least one hundred men a week see a stolen article in the sponge which they have read elsewhere they then believe it is all stolen and you lose them that isn't business so i want to sell you one original tale which will prove to be the most remarkable story written in england this year oh they all are said shorely wearily every story sent to me is a most remarkable story in the author's opinion look here shorely cried gibberts angrily you mustn't talk to me like that i'm no unknown author a fact of which you are very well aware i don't need to peddle my goods then why do you come here lecturing me for your own good surely my boy said gibberts calming down as rapidly as he had flared up he was a most uncertain man for your own good and if you don't take this story someone else will it will make the fortune of the paper that secures it now you read it while i wait here it is typewritten at one and three thousand words all to save your blessed eyesight shorely took the manuscript and lit the gas for it was getting dark gibbert sat down a while but soon began to pace the room much to shorely's manifest annoyance not content with this he picked up the poker and noisily stirred the fire for heaven's sake sit down gibberts and be quiet cried shorely at last gibbert seized the poker as if it had been a weapon and glared at the editor i won't sit down and i will make just as much noise as i want to he roared as he stood there defiantly, Shorely saw a gleam of insanity in his eyes. "'Oh, very well, then,' said Shorely, continuing to read the story. For a moment Gibbert stood grasping the poker by the middle, then he flung it with a clatter on the fender, and, sitting down, gazed moodily into the fire, without moving, until Shorely had turned the last page. "'Well?' said gibberts rousing from his reverie what do you think of it it's a good story gibberts all your stories are good said the editor carelessly gibberts started to his feet and swore do you mean to say he thundered that you see nothing in that story different from any i or anyone else ever wrote hang it surely you wouldn't know a good story if you met it coming up fleet street can't you see that story is written with a man's heart's blood shorely stretched out his legs and thrust his hands far down into his trousers pockets it may have been written as you say although i thought you called my attention a moment ago to its typewritten character don't be flippant shorely said gibberts relapsing again into melancholy you don't like the story then you didn't see anything unusual in it purpose force passion life death nothing there is death enough at the end my objection is that there is too much blood and thunder in it such a tragedy could never happen no man could go to a country house and slaughter everyone in it 
It's absurd. Gibbert sprang from his seat and began to pace the room excitedly. Suddenly he stopped before his friend, towering over him, his long ulster making him look taller than he really was. Did I ever tell you the tragedy of my life? How the property that would have kept me from want has... Of course you have, Gibberts. Sit down. You've told it to everybody. To me several times. How my cousin cheated me out of... Certainly, out of land and the woman you loved. Oh, I told you that, did I? said Gibberts apparently abashed at the other's familiarity with the circumstances. He sat down and rested his head in his hands. There was a long silence between the two, which was finally broken by Gibberts saying, "'So you don't care about the story?' "'Oh, I don't say that. I can see it as the story of your own life, with an imaginary and sanguinary ending.' oh you saw that did you yes how much do you want for it fifty pounds what fifty pounds i tell you are you deaf and i want the money now bless your innocent heart i could buy a longer story than that from the greatest author living for less than fifty pounds gibberts you're crazy Gibberts looked up suddenly and inquiringly, as if that thought had never occurred to him before. He seemed rather taken with the idea. It would explain many things which had puzzled both himself and his friends. He meditated upon the matter for a few moments, but at last shook his head. "'No, surely,' he said with a sigh, "'I'm not insane.' though goodness knows I've had enough to drive me mad. I don't seem to have the luck of some people. I haven't the talent for going crazy. But to return to the story, you think fifty pounds too much for it? It will make the fortune of the paper that publishes it. Let me see. I had it a moment ago, but the point has escaped my memory. What was it you objected to as unnatural? The tragedy. There is too much wholesome murder at the end. Ah, now I have it. Now I recollect. Gibberts began energetically to pace the room again, smiting his hands together. His face was in a glow of excitement. Yes, I have it now. The tragedy. Granting a murder like that, one man a dead shot, killing all the people in a country house, imagine it actually taking place. Wouldn't all England ring with it? Naturally. Of course it would. Now, you listen to me. I'm going to commit that so-called crime. One week after you publish the story, I'm going down to that country house, Channer Chase. It is my house, if there was justice and right in England, and I'm going to slaughter everyone in it. I will leave a letter saying the story in the sponge is the true story of what led to the tragedy. Your paper in a week will be the most talked-of journal in England. In the world! It will leap instantaneously into a circulation such as no weekly on earth ever before attained. Look here, Shorely, that story is worth fifty thousand pounds rather than fifty pounds, and if you don't buy it at once, someone else will. Now, what do you say? I say you are joking, or else, as I said just now, you are as mad as a hatter. Admitting I am mad, will you take the story? No, but I'll prevent you committing the crime. How? By giving you in charge, by informing on you. You can't do it. Until such a crime is committed, no one would believe it could be committed. You have no witnesses to our conversation here, and I will deny every assertion you make. 
my word at present is as good as yours all you can do is ruin your chance of fortune which knocks at every man's door when i came in you were wondering what you could do to put the sponge on its feet i saw it in your attitude now what do you say i'll give you twenty-five pounds for the story on its own merits although it is a big price and you need not commit the crime done that is the sum i wanted but i knew if i asked it you would offer me twelve pounds ten shillings will you publish it within the month yes very well write out the check don't cross it i've no bank account when the check was handed to him gibberts thrusted it into the ticket pocket of his ulster turned abruptly and unlocked the door good-bye he said as he disappeared shorely noticed how long his ulster was and how it flapped about his heels the next time he saw the novelist was under circumstances that could never be effaced from his memory the sponge was a sixteen-page paper with a blue cover and the week gibbert's story appeared it occupied the first seven pages as surely ran it over in the paper it impressed him more than it had done in manuscript a story always seems more convincing in type surely met several men at the club who spoke highly of the story and at last he began to believe it was a good one himself johnson was particularly enthusiastic and everyone in the club knew johnson's opinion was infallible how did you come to get hold of it he said to shorely with unnecessary emphasis on the personal pronoun don't you think i know a good story when i see it asked the editor indignantly it isn't the general belief of the club replied johnson airily but then all the members have sent you contributions so perhaps that accounts for it by the way have you seen gibberts lately no why do you ask well it strikes me he is acting rather queerly if you asked me i don't think he is quite sane he has something on his mind he told me said the new member with some hesitation but really i don't think i'm justified in mentioning it although he did not tell it in confidence that he was the rightful heir to a property in oh we all know that story cried the club unanimously i think it's the club whiskey said one of the oldest members i say it's the worst in london verbal complaints not received write to the committee put in johnson if gibberts has a friend in the club which i doubt that friend should look after him i believe he will commit suicide yet these sayings troubled shorely as he walked back to his office he sat down to write a note asking gibberts to call as he was writing mccabe the business manager of the sponge came in what's the matter with the old sheet this week he asked matter i don't understand you well i have just sent an order to the printer to run off an extra ten thousand and here comes a demand from smith's for the whole lot the extra ten thousand were to go to different news agents all over the country who have sent repeat orders so i have told the printer now to run off at least twenty five thousand and to keep the plates on the press i never read the sponge myself so i thought i would drop in and ask you what the attraction was this rush is unnatural better read the paper and find out said shorely i would if there wasn't so much of your stuff in it retorted mccabe next day mccabe reported an almost bewildering increase in orders he had a jubilant we've done it at last air that exasperated shorely 
who felt that he alone should have the credit. There had come no answer to the note he had sent Gibberts, so he went to the club in the hope of meeting him. He found Johnson, whom he asked if Gibberts were there. "'He's not been here today,' said Johnson. "'But I saw him yesterday, and what do you think he was doing? He was in a gun shop in the Strand, buying cartridges for that villainous-looking seven-shooter of his. I asked him what he was going to do with a revolver in London, and he told me, shortly, that it was none of my business, which struck me as so accurate a summing up of the situation that I came away without making further remark. If you want any more stories by Gibberts, you should look after him. Shorely found himself rapidly verging into a state of nervousness regarding Gibberts. He was actually beginning to believe the novelist meditated some wild action which might involve others in a disagreeable complication. Shorely had no desire to be accessory either before or after the fact. He hurried back to the office and there found Gibberts's belated reply to his note. He hastily tore it open, and the reading of it completely banished what little self-control he had left. "'Dear Shorely, I know why you want to see me, but I have so many affairs to settle that it is impossible for me to call upon you. However, have no fears. I shall stand to my bargain, without any goading from you. Only a few days have elapsed since the publication of the story, and I did not promise the tragedy before the week was out. I leave for Channer Chase this afternoon. You shall have your pound of flesh and more. Yours, Bromley Gibberts. Shorely was somewhat pale about the lips when he had finished this scrawl. He flung on his coat and rushed into the street. Calling a hansom, he said, Drive to Kidner's Inn as quickly as you can, number 15. Once there, he sprang up the steps two at a time and knocked at Gibbert's door. The novelist allowed himself the luxury of a man, and it was the man who answered Shorely's imperious knock. "'Where's Gibbert's?' "'He's just gone, sir.' "'Gone where?' "'To Euston Station, I believe, sir, and he took a hansom. "'He's going into the country for a week, sir, "'and I wasn't to forward his letters, so I haven't his address. "'Have you an ABC?' "'Yes, sir. Step inside, sir. "'Mr. Gibberts was just looking up trains in it, sir, before he left.' "'Shorely saw that it was open at sea and looking down the column to Channer, he found that a train left in about twenty minutes. Without a word he dashed down the stairs again. The man did not seem astonished. Queer fish sometimes came to see his master. "'Can you get me to Euston Station in twenty minutes?' The cabman shook his head as he said, I'll do my best, sir, but we ought to have a good half hour. The driver did his best and landed surely on the departure platform two minutes after the train had gone. When is the next train to Channer? demanded Shorely of a porter. Just left, sir. The next train hasn't just left, you fool. Answer my question. Two hours and twenty minutes, sir, replied the porter in a huff. Shorely thought of engaging a special, but realized he hadn't money enough. Perhaps he could telegraph and warn the people of Channer Chase, but he did not know to whom to telegraph. Or, again, he thought he might have Gibberts arrested on some charge or other at Channer Station. That, he concluded, was the way out dangerous but feasible by this time however the porter had recovered his equanimity porters cannot afford to cherish resentment 
and this particular porter saw half a crown in the air. "'Do you wish to reach Channer before the train that's just gone, sir?' "'Yes. Can it be done?' "'It might be done, sir,' said the porter hesitatingly, as if he were on the verge of divulging a state secret which would cost him his situation. He wanted the half-crown to become visible before he committed himself further. "'Here's half a sovereign, if you tell me how it can be done, short of hiring a special.' "'Well, sir, you could take the express that leaves at the half-hour.' It will carry you fifteen miles beyond Channer to Booley Junction. Then in seventeen minutes you can get a local back to Channer, which is due three minutes before the down train reaches there, if the local is in time, he added, when the gold piece was safe stowed in his pocket. While waiting for the express, Shorley bought a copy of the sponge, and once more he read Gibberts's story on the way down. The third reading appalled him. He was amazed he had not noticed before the deadly earnestness of its tone. We are apt to underrate or overrate the work of a man with whom we are personally familiar. Now, for the first time, Shorely seemed to get the proper perspective. The reading left him in a state of nervous collapse. He tried to remember whether or not he had burned Gibberts's letter. If he had left it on his table, anything might happen. It was incriminating evidence. The local was five minutes late at the junction, and it crawled over the fifteen miles back to Channer in the most exasperating way, losing time with every mile. At Channer he found the London train had come and gone. Did a man with a long ulster get off and... For Channer Chase, sir? Yes. Has he gone? Oh, yes, sir. The dog cart from the Chase was here to meet him, sir. How far is it? About five miles by road, if you mean the Chase, sir. Can I get a conveyance? I don't think so, sir. They didn't know you were coming, I suppose, or they would have waited. But if you take the road down by the church, you can get there before the cart, sir. It isn't more than two miles from the church. You'll find the path a bit dirty, I'm afraid, sir, but not worse than the road. You can't miss the way, and you can send for your luggage. It had been raining and was still drizzling. A strange path is sometimes difficult to follow, even in broad daylight, but a wet, dark evening adds tremendously to the problem. Shorley was a city man, and quite unused to the eccentricities of country lanes and paths. He first mistook the gleaming surface of a ditch for the footpath, and only found his mistake when he was up to his waist in water. The rain came on heavily again, and added to his troubles. After wandering through muddy fields for some time, he came to a cottage, where he succeeded in securing a guide to Channer Chase. The time he had lost wandering in the fields would, surely thought, allow the dog-cart to arrive before him, and such he found to be the case. The man who answered Shorley's imperious summons to the door was surprised to find a wild-eyed, unkempt, bedraggled individual who looked like a lunatic or a tramp. "'Has Mr. Bromley Gibberts arrived yet?' he asked without preliminary talk. "'Yes, sir,' answered the man. "'Is he in his room?' "'No, sir.' He has just come down, after dressing, and is in the drawing-room. "'I must see him at once,' gasped Shorley. "'It is a matter of life and death. Take me to the drawing-room.' The man, in some bewilderment, led him to the door of the drawing-room, and Shorley heard the sound of laughter from within. 
thus ever are comedy and tragedy mingled the man threw the door open and shorely entered the sight he beheld at first dazzled him for the room was brilliantly lighted he saw a number of people ladies and gentlemen all in evening dress and all looking towards the door with astonishment in their eyes several of them he noticed had copies of the sponge in their hands bromley gibbert stood before the fire and was very evidently interrupted in the middle of a narration i assure you he was saying that is the only way by which a story of the highest class can be sold to a london editor he stopped as he said this and turned to look at the intruder it was a moment or two before he recognized the dapper editor and the bedraggled individual who stood abashed at the door by the gods he exclaimed waving his hands speak of the editor and he appears in the name of all that's wonderful surely how did you come here have your deeds at last found you out have they ducked you in a horse pond i have just been telling my friends here how i sold you that story which is making the fortune of the sponge come forward and show yourself surely my boy i would like a word with you stammered surely then have it here said the novelist they all understand the circumstances come and tell them your side of the story i warn you said shorely pulling himself together and addressing the company that this man contemplates a dreadful crime and i have come here to prevent it gibberts threw back his head and laughed loudly search me he cried i am entirely unarmed and as everyone here knows among my best friends goodness said one old lady you don't mean to say that channer chase is the scene of your story and where the tragedy was to take place of course it is cried gibberts gleefully didn't you recognize the local color i thought i described channer chase down to the ground and did i not tell you you were all my victims i always forget some important detail when telling a story don't go yet he said as surely turned away but tell your story then we will have each man's narrative after the style of wilkie collins but surely had had enough and in spite of pressing invitations to remain he departed out into the night cursing the eccentricities of literary men end of section nine section ten of revenge by robert barr this librivox recording is in the public domain section ten not according to the code even a stranger to the big town walking for the first time through london sees on the sides of the houses many names which he has long been familiar his precognition has cost the firms those names represent much money in advertising the stranger has had the names before him for years in newspapers and magazines on the hoardings and boards by the railway side paying little heed to them at the time yet they have been indelibly impressed on his brain and when he wishes soap or pills his lips almost automatically frame the words most familiar to them thus are the lavish sums spent in advertising justified and thus are many excellent publications made possible when you come to ponder over the matter it seems strange that there should ever be any real men behind the name so lavishly advertised that there should be a genuine smith or jones whose justly celebrated medicines work such wonders or whose soap will clean even a guilty conscience granting the actual existence of these persons and probing still further into the mystery 
can any one imagine that the excellent smith to whom thousands of former sufferers send entirely unsolicited testimonials or the admirable jones whom prima donnas love because his soap preserves their dainty complexions can any one credit the fact that smith and jones have passions like other men have hatreds likes and dislikes such a condition of things incredible as it may appear exists in london there are men in the metropolis utterly unknown personally whose names are more widely spread over the earth than the names of the greatest novelists living or dead and these men have feeling and form like unto ourselves there was the firm of danby and strong for instance the name may mean nothing to any reader of these pages, but there was a time when it was well known and widely advertised, not only in England, but over the greater part of the world as well. They did a great business, as every firm that spends a fortune every year in advertising is bound to do. It was in the old paper-collar days. There actually was a time when the majority of men wore paper collars, and when you come to think of it, the wonder is that the paper-collar trade ever fell away as it did, when you consider with what vile laundries London is and always has been cursed. Take the Danby and Strong collars, for instance, advertised as being so similar to linen that only an expert could tell the difference. That was Strong's invention. Before he invented the Piccadilly collar, so-called, paper collars had a brilliant glaze that would not have deceived the most recent arrival from the most remote shire in the country. Strong devised some method by which a slight linen film was put on the paper, adding strength to the collar and giving it the appearance of the genuine article. You bought a pasteboard box containing a dozen of these collars for something like the price you paid for the washing of half a dozen linen ones. The Danby and Strong Piccadilly collar jumped at once into great popularity, and the wonder is that the linen collar ever recovered from the blow dealt it by this ingenious invention. Curiously enough, during the time the firm was struggling to establish itself, the two members of it were the best of friends but when prosperity came to them, causes of difference arose, and their relations, as the papers say of warlike nations, became strained. Whether the fault lay with John Danby or with William Strong, no one has ever been able to find out. They had mutual friends who claimed that each of them was a good fellow, but those friends always added that Strong and Danby did not hit it off. Strong was a bitter man when aroused, and could generally be counted upon to use harsh language. Danby was quieter, but there was a sullen streak of stubbornness in him that did not tend to the making up of a quarrel. They had been past the speaking point for more than a year when there came a crisis in their relations with each other that ended in disaster to the business carried on under the title of Danby and Strong. Neither man would budge, and between them the business sunk to ruin. Where competition is fierce, no firm can stand against it if there is internal dissension. Danby held his ground quietly but firmly. Strong raged and cursed, but was equally steadfast in not yielding a point. Each hated the other so bitterly that each was willing to lose his own share in a profitable business, if by doing so he could bring ruin on his partner. We are all rather prone to be misled by appearances. As one walks down Piccadilly or the Strand or Fleet Street, and meets numerous irreproachably dressed men with glossy tall hats and polished boots, with affable manners and a courteous way of deporting themselves toward their fellows, we are apt to fall into the fallacy of believing that these gentlemen are civilized. 
we fail to realize that if you probe in the right direction you will come upon possibilities of savagery that would draw forth the warmest commendation from a pawnee indian there are reputable business men in london who would if they dared tie an enemy to a stake and roast him over a slow fire and these men have succeeded so well not only in deceiving their neighbors but also themselves that they would actually be offended if you told them so if law were suspended in london for one day during which time none of us would be held answerable for any deed then done how many of us would be alive next morning most of us would go out to pot some favorite enemy and would doubtless be potted ourselves before we got safely home again the law however is a great restrainer and helps to keep the death rate from reaching excessive proportions one department of the law crushed out the remnant of the business of messrs danby and strong leaving the firm bankrupt while another department of the law prevented either of the partners taking the life of the other when strong found himself penniless he cursed as was his habit and wrote to a friend in texas asking if he could get anything to do over there he was tired of a country of law and order he said which was not as complimentary to texas as it might have been but his remark only goes to show what extraordinary ideas englishmen have of foreign parts the friend's answer was not very encouraging but nevertheless strong got himself out there somehow and in course of time became a cowboy he grew reasonably expert with his revolver and rode a mustang as well as could be expected considering that he had never seen such an animal in london even at the zoo the life of a cowboy on a texas ranch leads to the forgetting of such things as linen shirts and paper collars strong's hatred of danby never ceased but he began to think of him less often one day when he least expected it the subject was brought to his mind in a manner that startled him he was in galveston ordering supplies for the ranch when in passing a shop which he would have called a draper's but which was there designated as dealing in dry goods he was amazed to see the name danby and strong in big letters at the bottom of a huge pile of small cardboard boxes that filled the whole window at first the name merely struck him as familiar and he came near asking himself where have i seen that before it was some moments before he realized that the strong stood for the man gazing stupidly in at the plate-glass window then he noticed that the boxes were all guaranteed to contain the famous piccadilly collar he read in a dazed manner a large printed bill which stood beside the pile of boxes these collars it seemed were warranted to be the genuine danby and strong collar and the public was warned against imitations they were asserted to be london made and linen faced and the gratifying information was added that once a person wore the d n s collar he never afterwards relapsed into wearing any inferior brand the price of each box was fifteen cents or two boxes for a quarter strong found himself making a mental calculation which resulted in turning this notation into english money as he stood there a new interest began to fill his mind was the firm being carried on under the old name by someone else or did this lot of collars represent part of the old stock he had had no news from home since he left and the bitter thought occurred to him that perhaps danby had got somebody with capital to aid him in resuscitating the business he resolved to go inside and get some information 
"'You seem to have a very large stock of those collars on hand,' he said to the man who was evidently the proprietor. "'Yes,' was the answer. "'You see, we are the state agents for this make. We supply the country dealers.' "'Oh, do you? Is the firm of Danby and Strong still in existence? I understood it had suspended.' "'I guess not,' said the man. "'They supply us all right enough. Still, I really know nothing about the firm, except that they turn out a first-class article. We're not in any way responsible for Danby and Strong.' "'We're merely agents for the state of Texas, you know,' the man added with sudden caution. "'I have nothing against the firm,' said Strong. "'I asked because I once knew some members of it, and was wondering how it was getting along. "'Well, in that case you ought to see the American representative. "'He was here this week. "'That's why we make such a display in the window.' It always pleases the agent. He's now working up the state, and will be back in Galveston before the month is out. What's his name, do you remember? Danby. George Danby, I think. Here's his card. No, John Danby is the name. I thought it was George. Most Englishmen are George, you know. Strong looked at the card but the lettering seemed to waver before his eyes. He made out, however, that Mr. John Danby had an address in New York, and that he was the American representative of the firm of Danby and Strong, London. Strong placed the card on the counter before him. "'I used to know Mr. Danby, and I would like to meet him. Where do you think I could find him?' "'Well, as I said before, you could see him right here in Galveston if you wait a month. But if you are in a hurry, you might catch him at Bronco Junction on Thursday night.' "'Is he traveling by rail, then?' "'No, he is not. He went by rail as far as Felisopolis. There he takes a horse and goes across the prairies to Bronco Junction, a three days' journey.' I told him he wouldn't do much business on that route, but he said he was going partly for his health and partly to see the country. He expected to reach Bronco Thursday night. The dry goods merchant laughed as one who suddenly remembers a pleasant circumstance. You're an Englishman, I take it? Strong nodded. "'Well, I must say, you folks have queer notions about this country. Danby, who was going for a three days' journey across the plains, bought himself two Colt revolvers and a knife half as long as my arm. Now, I've traveled all over this state and never carried a gun. But I couldn't get Danby to believe his route was as safe as a church.' Of course, now and then in Texas a cowboy shoots off his gun, but it's more often his mouth, and I don't believe there's more killing done in Texas than in any other bit of land the same size. But you can't get an Englishman to believe that. You folks are an awful law-abiding crowd. For my part, I would sooner stand my chance with a revolver than a lawsuit any day. Then the good-natured Texan told the story of the pistol in Texas, of the general lack of demand for it, but the great necessity of having it handy when it was called for. A man with murder in his heart should not hold a conversation like this, but William Strong was too full of one idea to think of prudence. Such a talk sets the hounds of justice on the right trail, with unpleasant results for the criminal. On Thursday morning, Strong set out on horseback from Bronco Junction with his face towards Felisopolis. By noon he said to himself he ought to meet his former partner with nothing but the horizon around them. Besides the revolvers in his belt, Strong had a Winchester rifle in front of him. He did not know, but he might have to shoot at long range, 
and it was always well to prepare for eventualities. Twelve o'clock came, but he met no one, and there was nothing in sight around the empty circle of the horizon. It was nearly two before he saw a moving dot ahead of him. Danby was evidently unused to riding and had come leisurely. Some time before they met, Strong recognized his former partner, and he got his rifle ready. "'Throw up your hands!' he shouted, bringing his rifle butt to his shoulder. Danby instantly raised his hands above his head. "'I have no money on me,' he cried, evidently not recognizing his opponent. "'You may search me if you like.' "'Get down off your horse. Don't lower your hands or I fire.' Danby got down as well as he could with his hands above his head. Strong had thrown his right leg over to the left side of the horse, and, as his enemy got down, he also slid to the ground, keeping Danby covered with the rifle. "'I assure you I have only a few dollars with me, which you are quite welcome to,' said Danby. Strong did not answer. Seeing that the firing was to be at short range, he took a six-shooter from his belt, and, cocking it, covered his man, throwing the rifle on the grass. He walked up to his enemy, placed the muzzle of the revolver against his rapidly beating heart, and leisurely disarmed him, throwing Danby's weapons on the ground out of reach. Then he stood back a few paces and looked at the trembling man. His face seemed to have already taken on the hue of death, and his lips were bloodless. "'I see you recognize me at last, Mr. Danby. This is an unexpected meeting, is it not? You realize, I hope, that there are here no judges, juries, nor lawyers, no mandamuses, and no appeals. Nothing but a writ of ejectment from the barrel of a pistol and no legal way of staying the proceedings. In other words, no cursed quibbles and no damned law. Danby, after several times moistening his pallid lips, found his voice. Do you mean to give me a chance, or are you going to murder me? I am going to murder you. Danby closed his eyes, let his hands drop to his sides, and swayed gently from side to side, as a man does on the scaffold, just before the bolt is drawn. Strong lowered his revolver and fired, shattering one knee of the doomed man. Danby dropped with a cry that was drowned by the second report. The second bullet put out his left eye, and the murdered man lay with his mutilated face turned up to the blue sky. A revolver report on the prairies is short, sharp, and echoless. The silence that followed seemed intense and boundless, as if nowhere on earth there was such a thing as sound. The man on his back gave an awesome touch of the eternal to the stillness. Strong, now that it was all over, began to realize his position. Texas, perhaps, paid too little heed to life lost in fair fight, but she had an uncomfortable habit of putting a rope around the neck of a cowardly murderer. Strong was an inventor by nature. He proceeded to invent his justification. He took one of Danby's revolvers and fired two shots out of it into the empty air. This would show that the dead man had defended himself at least and it would be difficult to prove that he had not been the first to fire. He placed the other pistol and the knife in their places in Danby's belt. He took Danby's right hand while it was still warm, and closed the fingers around the butt of the revolver from which he had fired, placing the forefinger on the trigger of the cocked six-shooter. To give effect and naturalness to the tableau he was arranging, for the benefit of the next traveler by that trail, he drew up the right knee and put revolver and closed hand on it, 
as if Danby had been killed while just about to fire his third shot. Strong, with the pride of a true artist in his work, stepped back a pace or two for the purpose of seeing the effect of his work as a whole. As Danby fell, the back of his head had struck a lump of soil, or a tuft of grass, which threw the chin forward on the breast. As Strong looked at his victim, his heart jumped, and a sort of hypnotic fear took possession of him and paralyzed action at its source. Danby was not yet dead. His right eye was open, and it glared at Strong with a malice and hatred that mesmerized the murderer and held him there, although he felt rather than knew that he was covered by the cocked revolver he had placed in what he thought was a dead hand. Danby's lips moved, but no sound came from them. Strong could not take his fascinated gaze from the open eye. He knew he was a dead man if Danby had strength to crook his finger, yet he could not take the leap that would bring him out of range. The fifth pistol shot rang out, and Strong pitched forward on his face. The firm of Danby and Strong was dissolved. End of section 10。section 11 of Revenge by Robert Barr。this librivox recording is in the public domain。section 11 a modern Samson。a little more and Jean Rasteau would have been a giant。Brittany men are small as a rule but Jean was an exception. He was a powerful young fellow who, up to the time he was compelled to enter the army, had spent his life in dragging heavy nets over the sides of a boat. He knew the Brittany coast, rugged and indented as it is, as well as he knew the road from the little café on the square of the dwelling of his father on the hillside overlooking the sea. Never before had he been out of the sound of the waves, he was a man who, like Hervé Riel, might have saved the fleet, but France, with the usual good sense of officialism, sent this man of the coast into the mountains, and Jean Rasteau became a soldier in the Alpine Corps. If he stood on the highest mountain peak, Jean might look over illimitable wastes of snow, but he could catch neither sound nor sight of the sea. Men who mix with mountains become as rough and rugged as the rocks, and the Alpine Corps was a wild body, harsh and brutal. Punishment in the ranks was swift and terrible, for the Corps was situated far from any of the civilizing things of modern life, and deeds were done which the world knew not of, deeds which would not have been approved if reported at headquarters. The regiment of which Jean became a unit was stationed in a high valley that had but one outlet, a wild pass down which a mountain river roared and foamed and tossed. The narrow path by the side of this stream was the only way out of or into the valley, for all around the little plateau was walled in by immense peaks of everlasting snow, dazzling in the sunlight and luminous even in the still dark nights. From the peaks to the south, Italy might have been seen, but no man had ever dared to climb any of them. The angry little river was fed from a glacier whose blue breast lay sparkling in the sunshine to the south, and the stream circumnavigated the enclosed plateau as if trying to find an outlet for its tossing waters. Jean was terribly lonely in these dreary and unaccustomed solitudes. The white mountains awed him, and the mad roar of the river seemed but poor compensation for the dignified measured thunder of the waves and the broad sands of the Brittany coast. But Jean was a good-natured giant, and he strove to do whatever was required of him. He was not quick at repartee and the men mocked his Breton dialect. 
he became the butt for all their small and often mean jokes and from the first he was very miserable for added to his yearning for the sea whose steady roar he heard in his dreams at night he felt the utter lack of all human sympathy at first he endeavored by unfailing good nature and prompt obedience to win the regard of his fellows and he became in a measure the slave of the regiment but the more he tried to please the more his burden increased and the greater were the insults he was compelled to bear from both officers and men it was so easy to bully this giant whom they nicknamed samson that even the smallest men in the regiment felt at liberty to swear at him or cuff him if necessary but at last samson's good nature seemed to be wearing out his stock was becoming exhausted and his comrades forgot that the bretons for hundreds of years have been successful fighters and that the blood of contention flows in their veins although the alpine corps as a general thing contain the largest and strongest men in the french army yet the average french soldier may be termed undersized when compared with the military of either england or germany there were several physically small men in the regiment and one of these like a diminutive giant was samson's worst persecutor as there was no other man in the regiment whom the giant could bully samson received more than even he could be expected to bear one day the gnat ordered samson to bring him a pail of water from the stream and the big man unhesitatingly obeyed he spilled some of it coming up the bank and when he delivered it to the little man the latter abused him for not bringing the pail full and as several of the larger soldiers who had all in their turn made samson miserable were standing about the little man picked up the pail of water and dashed it into samson's face it was such a good opportunity for showing off before the big men who removed their pipes from their mouths and laughed loudly as samson with his knuckles tried to take the water out of his eyes then samson did an astonishing thing you miserable little insignificant rat he cried i could crush you but you are not worth it but to show you that i am not afraid of any of you there and there as he said these two words with emphasis he struck out from the shoulder not at the little man but at the two biggest men in the regiment and felled them like logs to the ground a cry of rage went up from their comrades but bullies are cowards at heart and while samson glared around at them no one made a move the matter was reported to the officer and samson was placed under arrest when the inquiry was held the officer expressed his astonishment at the fact that samson hit two men who had nothing to do with the insult he had received while the real culprit had been allowed to go unpunished they deserved it said samson sullenly for what they had done before i could not strike the little man i should have killed him silence cried the officer you must not answer me like that i shall answer you as i like said samson doggedly the officer sprang to his feet with a little rattan cane in his hand and struck the insubordinate soldier twice across the face each time raising an angry red mark before the guards had time to interfere samson sprang upon the officer lifted him like a child above his head and dashed him with a sickening crash to the ground where he lay motionless a cry of horror went up from everyone present i have had enough cried samson turning to go but he was met by a bristling hedge of steel he was like a rat in a trap he stood defiantly there a man maddened by oppression 
and glared around helplessly. Whatever might have been his punishment for striking his comrades, there was no doubt now about his fate. The guardhouse was a rude hut of logs situated on the banks of the roaring stream. Into this room Samson was flung, bound hand and foot to await the court-martial next day. The shattered officer, whose sword had broken in pieces under him, slowly revived and was carried to his quarters. A sentry marched up and down all night before the guardhouse. In the morning, when Samson was sent for, the guardhouse was found to be empty. The huge Breton had broken his bonds, as did Samson of old. He had pushed out a log of wood from the wall, and had squeezed himself through to the bank of the stream. There all trace of him was lost. If he had fallen in, then of course he had sentenced and executed himself. But in the mud near the water were great footprints which no boot but that of Samson could have made. So if he were in the stream, it must have been because he threw himself there. The trend of the footprints, however, indicated that he had climbed on the rocks, and there, of course, it was impossible to trace him. The sentries who guarded the pass maintained that no one had gone through during the night, but to make sure several men were sent down the path to overtake the runaway. Even if he reached a town or a village far below, so huge a man could not escape notice. The searchers were instructed to telegraph his description and his crime as soon as they reached a telegraph wire. It was impossible to hide in the valley, and a rapid search speedily convinced the officers that the delinquent was not there. As the sun rose higher and higher, until it began to shine even on the northward-facing snowfields, a sharp-eyed private reported that he saw a black speck moving high up on the great white slope south of the valley. The officer called for a field glass, and placing it to his eyes, examined the snow carefully. "'Call out a detachment,' he said. "'That is Samson on the mountain.' There was a great stir in the camp when the truth became known. Emissaries were sent after the searchers down the pass, calling them to return. "'He thinks to get to Italy,' said the officer. I did not imagine the fool knew so much of geography. We have him now secure enough." The officer who had been flung over Samson's head was now able to hobble about, and he was exceedingly bitter. Shading his eyes and gazing at the snow, he said, "'A good marksman ought to be able to bring him down.' "'There is no need of that.' replied his superior. He cannot escape. We have nothing to do but to wait for him. He will have to come down." All of which was perfectly true. A detachment crossed the stream and stacked its arms at the foot of the mountains, which Samson was trying to climb. There was a small level place a few yards wide between the bottom of the hill and the bank of the raging stream. On this bit of level ground the soldiers lay in the sun and smoked, while the officers stood in a group and watched the climbing man going steadily upward. For a short distance up from the plateau there was stunted grass and moss, with dark points of rock protruding from the scant soil. Above that again was a breadth of dirty snow, which, now that the sun was strong, sent little trickling streams down to the river. From there the long ridge of the mountain extended upwards, the vast smooth slope of virgin snow, pure and white, sparkling in the strong sunlight as if it had been sprinkled with diamond dust. A black speck against this tremendous field of white, the giant struggled on, 
and they could see by the glass that he sunk to the knee in the softening snow. "'Now,' said the officer, "'he is beginning to understand his situation.' Through the glass they saw Samson pause. From below it seemed as if the snow were as smooth as a sloping roof, but even to the naked eye a shadow crossed it near the top. That shadow was a tremendous ridge of overhanging snow, more than half a hundred feet deep, and Samson now paused as he realized that it was insurmountable. He looked down and undoubtedly saw a part of the regiment waiting for him below. He turned and plodded slowly under the overhanging ridge until he came to the precipice at his left. It was a thousand feet sheer down. He retraced his steps and walked to the similar precipice at the right. Then he came again to the middle of the great T, which his footmarks had made on that virgin slope. He sat down in the snow. No one will ever know what a moment of despair the Breton must have passed through when he realized the hopelessness of his toil. The officer who was gazing through the glass at him dropped his hand to his side and laughed. "'The nature of the situation,' he said, "'has at last dawned upon him. It took a long time to get an appreciation of it through his thick Breton skull.' "'Let me have the glass a moment,' said another. "'He has made up his mind about something.' The officer did not realize the full significance of what he saw through the glass. In spite of their conceit, their skulls were thicker than that of the persecuted Breton fishermen. Samson for a moment turned his face to the north and raised his face towards heaven. Whether it was an appeal to the saints he believed in, or an invocation to the distant ocean he was never more to look upon, who can tell? After a moment's pause, he flung himself headlong down the slope towards the section of the regiment which lounged on the bank of the river. Over and over he rolled, and then in place of the black figure there came downwards a white ball gathering bulk at every bound. It was several seconds before the significance of what they were gazing at burst upon officers and men. It came upon them simultaneously, and with it a wild panic of fear. In the still air a low, sullen roar arose. "'An avalanche! An avalanche!' they cried. The men and officers were hemmed in by the boiling torrent. Some of them plunged in to get to the other side, but the moment the water laid hold of them, their heels were whirled into the air, and they disappeared helplessly down the rapids. Samson was hours going up the mountain, but only seconds coming down. Like an overwhelming wave came the white crest of the avalanche, sweeping officers and men into and over the stream and far across the plateau. There was one mingled shriek which made itself heard through the sullen roar of the snow, then all was silence. The hemmed-in waters rose high and soon forced its way through the white barrier. When the remainder of the regiment dug out from the debris, the bodies of their comrades, they found a fixed look of the wildest terror on every face except one. Samson himself, without an unbroken bone in his body, slept as calmly as if he rested under the blue waters on the coast of Brittany. End of section 11「Section twelve of Revenge by Robert Barr. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Section twelve. A Deal on Change. 
It was in the days when drawing-rooms were dark and filled with bric-a-brac. The darkness enabled the half-blinded visitor, coming in out of the bright light, to knock over gracefully a two-hundred-dollar vase that had come from Japan to meet disaster in New York. In a corner of the room was seated, in a deep and luxurious armchair, a most beautiful woman. She was the wife of the son of the richest man in America. She was young. Her husband was devotedly fond of her. She was mistress of a palace. Anything that money could buy was hers, did she but express the wish. But she was weeping softly, and had just made up her mind that she was the most miserable creature in all the land. If a stranger had entered the room, he would have first been impressed by the fact that he was looking at the prettiest woman he had ever seen. Then he would have been haunted by the idea that he had met her somewhere before. If he were a man moving in artistic circles, he might perhaps remember that he had seen her face looking down at him from various canvases in picture exhibitions, and unless he were a stranger to the gossip of the country, he could hardly help recollecting the dreadful fuss the papers made, as if it were any business of theirs, when young Ed Druce married the artist's model, celebrated for her loveliness. Everyone has read the story of that marriage. Goodness knows the papers made the most of it, as is their custom. Young Ed, who knew much more of the world than did his father, expected stern opposition, and knowing the unlimited power unlimited wealth gave to the old man, he did not risk an interview with his parent, but eloped with the girl. The first inkling old man Druce had of the affair was from a vivid, sensational account of the runaway in an evening paper. He was pictured in the paper as an implacable father who was at that moment searching for the elopers with a shotgun. Old Druce had been too often the central figure of a journalistic sensation to mind what the sheet said. He promptly telegraphed all over the country and getting into communication with his son, asked him, electrically, as a favor to bring his young wife home and not make a fool of himself. So the errant pair, much relieved, came back to New York. Old Druce was a taciturn man, even with his only son. He wondered at first that the boy should have so misjudged him as to suppose he would raise objections, no matter whom the lad wished to marry. He was bewildered rather than enlightened when Ed told him he feared opposition because the girl was poor. What difference on earth did that make? Had he not money enough for all of them? If not, was there any trouble in adding to their store? Were there not railroads to be wrecked, stockholders to be fleeced? Wall Street lambs to be shorn? Surely a man married to please himself and not to make money. Ed assured the old man that cases had been known where a suspicion of mercenary motives had hovered round a matrimonial alliance, but Druce expressed the utmost contempt for such a state of things. At first, Ella had been rather afraid of her silent father-in-law whose very name made hundreds tremble and thousands curse, but she soon discovered that the old man actually stood in awe of her, and that his apparent brusqueness was the mere awkwardness he felt when in her presence. He was anxious to please her, and worried himself wondering whether there was anything she wanted. One day he fumblingly dropped a check for a million dollars in her lap, and with some nervous confusion asked her to run out, like a good girl, and buy herself something. If that wasn't enough, she was to call on him for more. The girl sprang from her chair and threw her arms around his neck, much to the old man's embarrassment, who was not accustomed to such a situation. She kissed him in spite of himself, allowing the check to flutter to the floor 
the most valuable bit of paper floating around loose in America that day. When he reached his office, he surprised his son. He shook his fist in the young fellow's face and said sternly, "'If you ever say a cross word to that little girl, I'll do what I've never done yet. I'll thrash you.' The young man laughed. "'All right, father. I'll deserve a thrashing in that case.' The old man became almost genial whenever he thought of his pretty daughter-in-law. "'My little girl,' he always called her. At first Wall Street men said old Druce was getting into his dotage, but when a nip came in the market and they found that, as usual, the old man was on the right side of the fence, they were compelled reluctantly to admit, with emptier pockets, that the dotage had not yet interfered with the financial corner of old Druce's mind. As young Mrs. Druce sat disconsolately in her drawing-room, the curtains parted gently, and her father-in-law entered stealthily, as if he were a thief, which indeed he was, and the very greatest of them. Druce had small, shifty, piercing eyes, that peered out from under his gray bushy eyebrows like two steel sparks. He never seemed to be looking directly at anyone, and his eyes somehow gave you the idea that they were trying to glance back over his shoulder, as if he feared pursuit. Some said that old Druce was in constant terror of assassination, while others held that he knew the devil was on his track and would ultimately nab him. "'I pity the devil when that day comes,' young Sneed said once, when someone had made the usual remark about Druce. This echoed the general feeling prevalent in Wall Street regarding the encounter that was admittedly by all to be inevitable. The old man stopped in the middle of the room when he noticed that his daughter-in-law was crying. "'Dear, dear,' he said, "'what is the matter?' Has Edward been saying anything cross to you? No, Papa, answered the girl. Nobody could be kinder to me than Ed is. There is nothing really the matter. Then, to put the truth of her statement beyond all question, she began to cry afresh. The old man sat down beside her, taking one hand in his own. Money? he asked in an eager whisper that seemed to say he was a solution of the difficulty if it were financial. "'Oh, dear, no. I have all the money, and more, that anyone can wish.' The old man's countenance fell. If money would not remedy the state of things, then he was out of his depth. "'Won't you tell me the trouble? Perhaps I can suggest... It's nothing you can help in, Papa. It is nothing much, anyway. The Mrs. Sneed won't call on me, that's all. The old man knit his brows and thoughtfully scratched his chin. Won't call, he echoed helplessly. No, they think I'm not good enough to associate with them, I suppose. The bushy eyebrows came down until they almost obscured the eyes, and a dangerous light seemed to scintillate out from under them. "'You must be mistaken. Good gracious! I am worth ten times what old Sneed is. Not good enough? Why, my name on a check is—' "'It isn't a question of checks, Papa,' wailed the girl. "'It's a question of society.' I was a painter's model before I married Ed, and no matter how rich I am, society won't have anything to do with me." The old man absent-mindedly rubbed his chin, which was a habit he had when perplexed. He was face to face with a problem entirely outside his province. Suddenly a happy thought struck him. "'Those Sneed women!' he said in tones of great contempt. "'What do they amount to, anyhow? They're nothing but sour old maids. They never were half so pretty as you. 
why should you care whether they call on you or not they represent society if they came others would but society can't have anything against you nobody has ever said a word against your character model or no model the girl shook her head hopelessly character does not count in society in this statement she was of course absurdly wrong but she felt bitter at all the world those who know society are well aware that character counts for everything within its sacred precincts so the unjust remark should not be set down to the discredit of an inexperienced girl i'll tell you what i'll do cried the old man brightening up i'll speak to general sneed tomorrow i'll arrange the whole business in five minutes do you think that would do any good asked young mrs druce dubiously good you bet it'll do good it will settle the whole thing i've helped sneed out of a pinch before now and he'll fix up a little matter like that for me in no time i'll just have a quiet talk with the general tomorrow and you'll see the sneed carriage at the door next day at the very latest he patted her smooth white hand affectionately so don't you trouble little girl about trifles and whenever you want help you just tell the old man he knows a thing or two yet whether it is on wall street or fifth avenue sneed was known in new york as the general probably because he had absolutely no military experience whatever next to druce he had the most power in the financial world of america but there was a great distance between the first and the second if it came to a deal in which the general and all the world stood against druce the average wall street man would have bet on druce against the whole combination besides this the general had the reputation of being a square man and that naturally told against him for everyone knew that druce was utterly unscrupulous but if druce and sneed were known to be together in a deal then the financial world of new york ran for shelter therefore when new york saw old druce come in with the stealthy tread of a two-legged leopard and glance furtively around the great room singling out sneed with an almost imperceptible side nod retiring with him into a remote corner where more ruin had been concocted than on any other spot on earth and talking there eagerly with him a hush fell on the vast assemblage of men and for the moment the financial heart of the nation ceased to beat when they saw sneed take out his notebook nodding assent to whatever proposition druce was making a cold shiver ran up the financial backbone of new york the shiver communicated itself to the electric nerve web of the world and storm signals began to fly on the monetary centers of london paris berlin and vienna uncertainty paralyzed the markets of the earth because two old gamblers were holding a whispered conversation with a multitude of men watching them out of the corners of their eyes i'd give half a million to know what those two old fiends are concocting said john p buller the great wheat operator and he meant it which goes to show that a man does not really know what he wants and would be very dissatisfied if he got it look here general said druce i want you to do me a favor all right replied the general i'm with you it's about my little girl continued druce rubbing his chin not knowing just how to explain matters in the cold financial atmosphere of the place in which they found themselves oh about ed's wife said sneed looking puzzled yes she's fretting her heart out because your two girls won't call upon her i found her crying about it yesterday afternoon won't call 
cried the general, a bewildered look coming over his face. "'Haven't they called yet? You see, I don't bother much about that sort of thing.' "'Neither do I. No, they haven't called. I don't suppose they mean anything by it, but my little girl thinks they do, so I said I would speak to you about it. "'Well, I'm glad you did. I'll see to that the moment I get home. What time shall I tell them to call?' The innocent old man, little comprehending what he was promising, pulled out his notebook and pencil, looking inquiringly at Druce. "'Oh, I don't know. Any time that is convenient for them. I suppose women know about all that.' My little girl is at home most all afternoon, I guess. The two men cordially shook hands, and the market instantly collapsed. It took three days for the financial situation to recover its tone. Druce had not been visible, and that was all the more ominous. The older operators did not relax their caution, because the blow had not yet fallen. They shook their heads and said the cyclone would be all the worse when it came. Old Druce came among them the third day, and there was a set look about his lips which students of his countenance did not like. The situation was complicated by the evident fact that the general was trying to avoid him. At last, however, this was no longer possible. The two men met and after a word or two they walked up and down together. Druce appeared to be saying little, and the firm set of his lips did not relax, while the general talked rapidly and was seemingly making some appeal that was not responded to. Stocks instantly went up a few points. "'You see, Druce, it's like this,' the general was saying. The women have their world, and we have ours. They are, in a measure—' "'Are they going to call?' asked Druce curtly. "'Just let me finish what I was about to say. Women have their rules of conduct, and we have—' "'Are they going to call?' repeated Druce in the same hard tone of voice. The general removed his hat and drew his handkerchief across his brow and over the bald spot on his head. He wished himself in any place but where he was, inwardly cursing womankind and all their silly doings. Bracing up after removing the moisture from his forehead, he took on an expostulatory tone. "'See here, Druce, hang it all, don't shove a man into a corner.' Suppose I ask you to go to Mrs. Ed and tell her not to fret about trifles. Do you suppose she wouldn't, just because you wanted her not to? Come now." Druce's silence encouraged the general to take it for assent. "'Very well, then. You're a bigger man than I am, and if you could do nothing with one young woman anxious to please you, what do you expect me to do with two old maids as set in their ways as the Palisades? It's all dumb nonsense, anyhow." Druce remained silent. After an irksome pause, the hapless general floundered on. As I said at first, women have their world and we have ours. Now, Druce, you're a man of solid common sense. What would you think if Mrs. Ed were to come here and insist on your buying Wabash stock when you wanted to load up with Lake Shore? Look how absurd that would be. Very well, then. We have no more right to interfere with the women than they have to interfere with us. If my little girl wanted the whole Wabash system, I'd buy it for her tomorrow said Druce, with rising anger. "'Lord, what a slump that would make in the market!' cried the general, his feeling of discomfort being momentarily overcome by the magnificence of Druce's suggestion. "'However, all this doesn't need to make any difference in our friendship. If I can be of any assistance financially, 
I shall only be too—' "'Oh, I need your financial assistance,' sneered Druce. He took his defeat badly. However, in a minute or two, he pulled himself together and seemed to shake off his trouble. "'What nonsense I am talking!' he said when he had obtained control of himself. "'We all need assistance now and then, and none of us know when we may need it badly. In fact, there is a little deal I intended to speak to you about today, but this confounded business drove it out of my mind. How much gilt-edged security have you in your safe?' "'About three millions worth,' replied the general, brightening up now that they were off the thin ice. "'That will be enough for me if we can make a dicker. Suppose we adjourn to your office. This is too public a place for a talk.' They went out together. "'So there is no ill-feeling?' said the general, as Druce arose to go with the securities in his handbag. "'No, but we'll stick strictly to business after this, and leave social questions alone. By the way, to show that there is no ill-feeling, will you come with me for a blow on the sea? Suppose we say Friday. I have just telegraphed for my yacht and she will leave Newport tonight. I'll have some good champagne on board. I thought sailors imagined Friday was an unlucky day. My sailors don't. Will eight o'clock be too early for you? Twenty-third Street Wharf. The general hesitated. Druce was wonderfully friendly all of a sudden, and he knew enough of him to be just a trifle suspicious. But when he recollected that Druce himself was going, he said, "'Where could a telegram reach us if it were necessary to telegraph? The market is a trifle shaky, and I don't like being out of town all day.' "'The fact that we are both on the yacht will steady the market. But we can drop in at Long Branch and receive dispatches, if you think it necessary.' "'All right,' said the general, much relieved. "'I'll meet you at 23rd Street at 8 o'clock Friday morning, then.' Druce's yacht, the Seahound, was a magnificent steamer, almost as large as an Atlantic liner. It was currently believed in New York that Druce kept her for the sole purpose of being able to escape in her, should an exasperated country ever rise in its might, and demand his blood. It was rumored that the sea hound was ballasted with bars of solid gold and provisioned for a two years cruise. Mr. Buller, however, claimed that the tendency of nature was to revert to original conditions, and that some fine morning Druce would hoist the black flag, sail away, and become a real pirate. The great speculator, in a very nautical suit, was waiting for the general when he drove up, and the moment he came aboard, lines were cast off and the sea hound steamed slowly down the bay. The morning was rather thick, so they were obliged to move cautiously, and before they reached the bar the fog came down so densely that they had to stop while the bell rang and whistle blew. They were held there until it was nearly eleven o'clock, but time passed quickly, for there were all the morning papers to read, neither of the men having had an opportunity to look at them before leaving the city. As the fog cleared away and the engines began to move, the captain sent down and asked Mr. Druce if he would come on deck for a moment. The captain was a shrewd man and understood his employer. "'There's a tug making for us, sir, signaling us to stop. Shall we stop?' Old Druce rubbed his chin thoughtfully and looked over the stern of the yacht. He saw a tug with a banner of black smoke tearing after them, heaping up a ridge of white foam ahead of her. Some flags fluttered from the single mast in front, 
and she shattered the air with short, hoarse shrieks of the whistle. "'Can she overtake us?' The captain smiled. "'Nothing in the harbor can overtake us, sir.' "'Very well, then. Full steam ahead. Don't answer the signals. You did not happen to see them, you know.' "'Quite so, sir,' replied the captain, going forward. Although the motion of the Seahound's engines could hardly be felt, the tug, in spite of all her efforts, did not seem to be gaining. When the yacht put on her speed, the little steamer gradually fell farther and farther behind, and at last gave up the hopeless chase. When well out at sea, something went wrong with the engines, and there was a second delay of some hours. A stop at Long Branch was therefore out of the question. "'I told you Friday was an unlucky day,' said the general. It was eight o'clock that evening before the Seahound stood off from the 23rd Street wharf. "'I'll have to put you ashore on a small boat,' said Druce. "'You won't mind that, I hope. The captain is so uncertain about the engines that he doesn't want to go nearer land. "'Oh, I don't mind in the least. Good night. I've had a lovely day.' "'I'm glad you enjoyed it. We will take another trip together sometime, when I hope so many things won't happen as happened today.' The general saw that his carriage was waiting for him, but the waning light did not permit him to recognize his son until he was up on dry land once more. The look in his son's face appalled the old man. "'My God, John, what has happened?' "'Everything's happened. Where are the securities that were in the safe?' "'Oh, they're all right,' said his father, a feeling of relief coming over him. Then the thought flashed through his mind. How did John know they were not in the safe? Sneed kept a tight rein on his affairs, and no one but himself knew the combination that would open the safe. How did you know that the securities were not there? Because I had the safe blown open at one o'clock today. Blown open? For heaven's sake, why? Step into the carriage, and I'll tell you on the way home. The bottom dropped out of everything. All the Sneed stocks went down with a run. We sent a tug after you, but that old devil had you tight. If I could have got at the bonds, I think I could have stopped the run. The situation might have been saved up to one o'clock, but after that, when the street saw we were doing nothing, all creation couldn't have stopped it. Where are the bonds? I sold them to Drews. What did you get? Cash? I took his check on the Trust National Bank. Did you cash it? Did you cash it? cried the young man. And if you did, where is the money? Drews asked me as a favor not to present the check until tomorrow. The young man made a gesture of despair. The Trust National went to smash today at two. We are paupers, father. We haven't a cent left out of the wreck. That check business is so evidently a fraud that... But what's the use of talking? Old Druce has the money, and he can buy all the law he wants in New York. God, I'd like to have a seven seconds interview with him with a loaded seven-shooter in my hand. We'd see how much the law would do for him then. General Sneed despondently shook his head. It's no use, John, he said. We're in the same business ourselves. Only this time we got the hot end of the poker. But he played it low down on me, pretending to be friendly and all that. The two men did not speak again until the carriage drew up at the brownstone mansion which earlier in the day Sneed would have called his own. 
sixteen reporters were waiting for them, but the old man succeeded in escaping to his room, leaving John to battle with the newspaper men. Next morning the papers were full of the news of the panic. They said that old Druce had gone in his yacht for a trip up the New England coast. They deduced from this fact that, after all, Druce might not have had a hand in the disaster. Everything was always blamed on Druce. Still, it was admitted that, whoever suffered, the Druce stocks were all right. They were quite unanimously frank in saying that the Sneeds were wiped out, whatever that might mean. The general had refused himself to all the reporters, while young Sneed seemed to be able to do nothing but swear. Shortly before noon, General Sneed, who had not left the house, received a letter brought by a messenger. He feverishly tore it open, for he recognized on the envelope the well-known scrawl of the great speculator. Dear Sneed, it ran, you will see by the papers that I am off on a cruise, but they are wrong, as they usually are when they speak of me. I learned there was a bit of a flutter in the market while we were away yesterday, and I am glad to say that my brokers, who are sharp men, did me a good turn or two. I often wonder why these flurries come, but I suppose it is to let a man pick up some sound stocks at a reasonable rate if he has the money by him. Perhaps they are also sent to teach humility to those who might else become purse-proud. We are but finite creatures, Sneed, here today and gone tomorrow. How foolish a thing is pride! And that reminds me that if your two daughters should happen to think, as I do, on the uncertainty of riches, I wish you would ask them to call. I have done up those securities in a sealed package and given the parcel to my daughter-in-law. She has no idea what the value of it is, but thinks it a little present from me to your girls. If, then, they should happen to call, she will hand it to them. If not, I shall use the contents to found a college for the purpose of teaching manners to young women whose grandfather used to feed pigs for a living as indeed my own grandfather did. Should the ladies happen to like each other, I think I can put you on a deal next week that will make up for Friday. I like you, Sneed, but you have no head for business. Seek my advice oftener. Ever yours, Druce. The Sneed girls called on Mrs. Edward Druce. End of section 12